Hello and welcome back to Multivariable Calculus, the video series where we talk a lot about calculus in n dimensions. And in today's part 21, we will talk about so called diffeomorphisms. They will be very important later when we talk about the implicit function theorem. However, you already know, before we start with the definitions, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube, or via Patreon. And as a reminder, you get additional material for all the videos with the link in the description. Okay, then let's immediately start with diffeomorphisms, and indeed, they are not so complicated. Just imagine that we have a map from Rn into Rn again. And now if we have a nice map, then this one could be bijective, and then we can go backwards. And then usually the natural question is, do we have the same nice properties for f inverse if f has these nice properties? In fact, for most properties, this is not immediately given, and therefore we introduce some names for some special maps. In that sense, you can already remember, if both maps are differentiable, we speak of a diffeomorphism. However, in order to write down the explicit definition here, we first have to recall some notations. So what one normally uses is a CK space. Which means we actually want to have continuously differentiable functions. And we write CK if we want to have K times continuously differentiable functions. Indeed, it can be very general. It can start with our domain Rn and end with the codomain Rm. This means this is a whole set of functions that have n inputs and m outputs. So this is not so complicated, it's just an ordinary map, but now we want that the partial derivatives exist. And maybe it's a little bit easier to see f as a collection of m functions that map from Rn into R. And these components functions we could just call fj. And now we want that all the partial derivatives up to the order k exist. Apparently, this is equivalent to saying that all the partial derivatives of order k exist. Moreover, we also want that the functions that come out are continuous. So you see, the definition is not so complicated, it just means that all the partial derivatives are well behaved in this sense. In addition, you should also know that we can generalize this notion by looking at open sets in Rn and Rm. Indeed, the whole definition looks the same, only the notation looks different. This simply means, in this case, we just write CK uv. Obviously, this is very important, because often we don't define the map on the whole space Rn. And in the case we want to have a bijective map, perhaps we also have to restrict the codomain. Okay, then I would say, before we start with the important definition of the video, let's first look at an example. Let's take a function f from r2 into r2. And now a possible definition would be that f of x and y is equal to x times y and 2 in the second component. And now we should not have a problem calculating partial derivatives. And there let's use the multi-index notation d alpha f. And now let's say our alpha here is given by 1, 0. Which means it's just a partial derivative with respect to x. Therefore, we simply get out y, 0. Okay, and then in the same way, we could consider the multi-index alpha is equal to 1, 1. So first the partial derivative with respect to x and then with respect to y. And at this point we already see, no matter which multi-index we use, we always get out continuous functions in the components. Therefore, this f is indeed in C infinity. And there you know, this is the strongest requirement we have, because it means f lies in all the CKs here. In other words, C infinity is just the intersection of all the CKs. So we can just write a big intersection symbol, where k goes from 1 to infinity. So this is important to remember, because often we have such nice C infinity functions. However, the question of this video is, what happens if we invert the function? In this case, 
we could definitely lose our C infinity property. We will consider some examples soon, but let's first write down this important definition. The first thing we need here are two open sets, U and V, but now both in Rn. And then we call a map F from U into V, a CK diffeomorphism if we have three properties fulfilled. So you see, we already distinguish in the name how good the diffeomorphism is. And obviously the best one would be the C infinity diffeomorphism. Okay, then let's write down the three properties. And obviously first we want that f is a CK function. So we would say f is continuously differentiable up to the order k. Of course it could be also better, but at least we have the order k. Now the next thing is also expected. We want to invert the function f, so we need a bijection. This means the inverse f to the power minus 1 makes sense. And now we also want that this one is k times continuously differentiable. Hence this one is now in ck vu. So you can simply remember a ck diffeomorphism is a bijective map that is in both ways continuously differentiable up to the order k. And now to visualize that let's look at some simple examples. Therefore let's start with one dimensional examples. In particular we could consider the quadratic function f of x is given by x squared. Obviously this is not a bijective function if we consider that on the whole real number line. However it is bijective if the domain and the codomain are given by the positive numbers. Because then the inverse function is given by the square root of positive numbers. So f inverse of x tilde is well defined. Moreover, without any doubt, we immediately see that f is continuously differentiable and f inverse as well. So what we have here is a very nice example of a C1 diffeomorphism. And we don't have to stop there because we can easily show that all derivatives exist. So we have a C infinity diffeomorphism. Okay, so this was not a complicated example and I would say the next one could be a counterexample. Now instead of x to the power 2, now we could consider x to the power 3. And there you should know this is a bijective function from R to R. So in fact a and b from the definition are no problem at all. So the only question here is what is about the differentiability of the inverse f to the power minus 1. Which by a formula is just given by the third root of x tilde. But to be more precise we should consider two cases. The first case is the same as before, it's the positive one, so we can just write third root of x tilde. I don't want to have any negative numbers under the root sign and therefore I write minus x tilde. However, since the outcome has to be a negative number again, we put a minus sign in front. Indeed, the whole thing is not hard to understand if you just look at the graph of the corresponding functions. And there x cubed would look like this. And then in order to get the inverse, you would mirror it, reflect it on the diagonal here. And then the result is a graph that looks more or less like this. And there we immediately see the problem because here at the origin we have an infinite slope. In other words, if you calculate the derivative at zero, you get out infinity. This means this nice function f inverse is not differentiable at x tilde is equal to zero. And therefore the last point in the definition of a diffeomorphism is not satisfied. So despite f being in C infinity, f is not even a C1 diffeomorphism. Simply because its inverse is not so nicely behaved. Therefore you see we cannot omit the last property in the definition. And now you might think perhaps this is the only thing that can go wrong. Meaning if you have a slope of zero in the original function, obviously the inverse function has this bad slope of infinity then. So maybe it's sufficient to exclude such slopes of zero. 
And before we continue this necessary discussion about the slopes, we should definitely go to our multidimensional case again. So let's say we already know that f is a C1 diffeomorphism. This means we have our inverse and we can compose it with f to get out the identity map. More concretely, this would be the identity map on the set U and the other order here, f composed with f inverse, would give us the identity on V. Okay, and now for both equations, we can form the differentials, which means we look at the Jacobians. And of course, the Jacobian of the identity map is given by the identity matrix. So on the left hand side, we have the Jacobian of this composition at the point X. And on the right hand side, we simply have the identity matrix. And the same for the second equation, just for the other composition. And now the important ingredient is that we know that both functions in the compositions are differentiable, so we can use the chain rule. This means here we have a product of two Jacobians. The Jacobian of f inverse times the Jacobian of f. And of course we can do the same chain rule here for the second equation and then we get the different order of the Jacobian matrices. However, both are equal to the identity matrix, which simply means that both Jacobians are invertible. Indeed, the only thing you have to do here is to choose the correct x tilde for a given x. And then our important conclusion here is that the Jacobian of f is invertible. So it's not a singular matrix, no matter which point x you put in. And you know from linear algebra that this is equivalent to the fact that the determinant of this matrix is non-zero. Hence, this is a necessary condition we have for a C1 diffeomorphism. And please note, in one dimension, it exactly means that we don't have the slope zero. However, the crucial point now is that this is not a sufficient criterion for being a C1 diffeomorphism if our dimension is greater or equal than two. This means in higher dimension, even stranger things than that from before can happen. But I would say, let's discuss this in the next videos. So I really hope we meet again and have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you.